Hey, everybody, just want to take a minute to shout out a couple of podcasts that I've been listening to. The first one is called She Sleuths. It's hard for me to say it for some reason. She Sleuths. It's two hilarious women who have an obsession with true crime. One's in Michigan, one's in uh, Texas. I've really enjoyed their banter and their take on true crime. It's definitely been a joy to listen to. Uh, Follow them, listen to them wherever you get your podcasts. And then at the end of this, there's a promo for another podcast that, that I think you might also be interested in. So stay tuned for that. This is True Consequences, a true crime and mystery podcast with stories based in New Mexico in the American Desert Southwest. Welcome back to True Consequences. I'm your host, Eric Carter Landine. Today we are discussing a case I wasn't fully aware of until recently. My sources were a few things. So there's an article from Taos News. Um, there's an article on the mountainmessenger.com. There's also an article on the Santa Fe New Mexican. And a lot of the information I got was from the Murder in the Heartland episode about this case. This case occurred near Taos, New Mexico. Taos is in northern New Mexico. It is an incredibly beautiful area. It's very scenic, and it's one of the most beautiful parts of New Mexico. Although, that is just my opinion. Taos is just south of the Colorado border. The Rocky Mountains rest to the east of Taos. The range specifically near Taos is known as the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, or when you translate that into English, it's the Blood of Christ. The Rio Grande snakes to the west of the city. The erosion caused by the river created what's called the Rio Grande Gorge. The gorge is about 800 feet deep, and you can see images of it on my social media pages as well as my website. Again, just a reminder, Facebook is True Consequences Pod, Instagram is the same, True Consequences Pod, and Twitter is True Cons Pod. Our website is www.trueconsequences.com. The waters of the Rio Grande in this area are turquoise blue. There are several parts of the river that actually have whitewater rapids. It is stunning. You often find people riding those whitewater rapids, fly fishing, swimming in the river. It's really just a bucolic, gorgeous area. And in the mountains, you find many tourists coming out from other parts of the country to ski. In fact, Taos has one of the best ski areas in New Mexico. Taos is also known as an artist community. It's also home to one of the 19 tribes of Pueblo Native Americans in New Mexico, the Taos Pueblo Indians. It's considered to be a very spiritual place. As a result, it's also a haven for hippies, spiritualists, and people seeking a more natural way of life. In fact, there is a community of earthship owners. Never heard of earthships? Well, you should look them up. They're pretty fascinating. They're homes that are built into the earth, and they're made out of recycled materials like tires, glass bottles, aluminum cans, dirt. Some of them are surprisingly chic and modern, and some of them are just plain weird. They're also off the grid, so they use things like solar power, wind power, recycled water, all that stuff. But I digress. You didn't come here today to listen to a commercial on Taos tourism or even to get history on earth ships or eco-friendly housing, so I'll move on. So on December 25th, 2015, Elizabeth and Rob Haggerty decide to go hiking near the Two Peaks area, which is close to Taos. Two Peaks area is basically a mountain that has what looks like two peaks, which is why they call it that. They were really just trying to take their dogs on a walk near the Taos Mesa. They wanted to honor one of their dogs that had recently been put down. They were hiking along a dry riverbed, and while on the hike, they stumbled upon a hole, which they didn't suspect really anything about it at first, until their dogs began to dig at the area. It quickly became apparent that they had stumbled upon a shallow grave. In fact, Robin and Elizabeth noticed something was strange when they saw a bone sticking out of the ground. It turns out that the dogs had uncovered what looked like a femur, as well as a bra that looked like it had been badly burned. According to Rob and Elizabeth, they were sure that something terrible had happened there, and they were almost certain that it was a murder. So the couple called the police to report the incident. The police met with them, and the Haggertys escorted the police to the site. 
So the interesting thing here is as soon as the police got there, they knew something was up. And on the episode of Murder in the Heartland, the police start talking about what an unsafe area Two Peaks is. In fact, it's considered to be kind of dangerous because a lot of people are living off the grid. And they're living off the grid for a reason. They're really trying to avoid interacting with authorities. You'll often find uh, camper trailers, mobile homes, makeshift earth ships, that kind of thing in the Two Peaks area. In fact, there really aren't any paved roads and city utilities do not go there. Police officers believe that anarchists live in the Two Peaks area. All right, but let's get back to the story here. So when the police got there, the body was almost completely decomposed. They took the body to the medical examiner to conduct an autopsy. The medical examiner determined that the body was of an adult, female, African-American. They also determined that she had been dead for at least six months, if not more. One of the things about this is Taos is a very snowy area in New Mexico. So it's really hard to tell how long that body had been there, especially because the snow could have really helped preserve the remains for a little bit longer. So one of the things that was apparent was that there was a significant amount of skull damage in the shape of a hole, which led the police to believe that it was a potential gunshot wound. The medical examiner ruled the cause of death as a homicide. Now the police launch a full investigation to try to figure out not only who this woman was, but what happened to her. So they started to comb through missing persons reports. One of the people that stood out to police right away was Roxanne Houston. So Roxanne was born in Colorado Springs and the police reached out to her parents. The police informed Roxanne's parents that they had found a body near the Taos Mesa and they wanted to make sure that it wasn't her. So they asked the parents to send something that they could use to compare to the bones. The parents sent over a CAT scan. The police had the medical investigator compare the scan to the skeletal remains. It was a match. So Roxanne Houston actually lived in Colorado Springs until 2013. She moved to New Mexico with her boyfriend, Vernon. One of the things I found in one of the sources I'm going to list on the show notes is there's speculation that Roxanne was bipolar. She was known to be a practicing Wiccan. She also had four children, which had been adopted because Houston's life was a little complicated. Houston disappeared in July of 2014, and it took six months for her body to be found. Once the police had the victim, they started trying to figure out who the culprit was, who was responsible for taking her life. So they start interviewing people, and they really start looking in the Two Peaks area, because Roxanne did live there. In fact, she and Vernon moved to the Two Peaks area and moved in with another person, named Johnny. In the episode of Murder in the Heartland, a lot of people were being interviewed and many of them claimed to be very close to Roxanne. One of the major themes in what was heard in those interviews was the fact that Roxanne was a very generous and kind person. In fact, she would often run errands for people who lived in the Two Peaks area, especially for people who had a hard time getting around. There was one gentleman in particular who talked about the fact that she would often go and buy groceries for him because he wasn't able to get out. It really was a very generous and kind thing for her to do. So one of the weird twists in this scenario is there seemed to be a little bit of a love triangle between Johnny and Vernon and Roxanne. You see, once they moved in with Johnny, Roxanne started to develop feelings for Johnny, which made Vernon very jealous. And Johnny was also jealous of Vernon. So you can imagine that they quickly moved up to the top of the suspect list. I think you know if you're listening to this show and if you listen to any true crime uh, podcasts or watch any true crime shows that most of the time they're pretty sure it's going to be an intimate partner that's responsible for something like this. So they started questioning both Johnny and Vernon. Along with that, they questioned several friends. One of Roxanne's friends claimed that she had seen Roxanne on the day that she disappeared. She said that she had met her near Johnny's house, and she explained that Roxanne told her her and Johnny had a big fight the night before, and she was planning to move back to Colorado. She was going to help Vernon find a place to live, and get him settled, and then she would come back to Taos after she was done. So let's talk about Johnny. Uh, Johnny was an intimate partner of Roxanne, He actually was the person who reported her missing. 
Um, again, like I said, he was in a bit of a love triangle between Roxanne and Vernon, but he was the one who invited both of them to live with him. So Johnny's jealousy was actually what precipitated the fight the night before she disappeared. And he was extremely jealous of Vernon. In fact, he thought that Roxanne was going to leave him for Vernon. That night, Roxanne left Johnny's house and Johnny also left to go to a friend's house. He actually didn't realize that she was even gone until he got back home. So the police believe that Vernon's possible motive was that Roxanne had left him for Johnny. They also thought that Johnny's possible motive was that Roxanne was unwilling to let go of her relationship with Vernon. And that's actually what caused the fight. So they were kind of going back and forth between, you know, is it Johnny? Is it Vernon? Who's responsible here? As they're going through this investigation and questioning Johnny, he brings up an interesting point. He claims that there's a man who lived in a tent on his property named Ivan. He said Ivan has a gun. He also said he thought that Ivan was strange and could have been responsible for this. So the police started looking into Ivan. They found him and they interviewed him. He denied any involvement and he pointed to the fact that Roxanne and Johnny were fighting so loudly that he heard them in his tent. He actually moved his camp So when they asked him if he owned any firearms, he stated that he did not. He shared that he had a shotgun and a twenty-two, but that was in the past. He denied owning a handgun. Ivan then points his finger at Vernon. He thought that for sure Vernon had a gun. And he thought maybe Vernon was responsible because he was jealous of Johnny. Here's the problem. Ivan didn't have an alibi. The other problem was he really didn't seem to have a motive He wasn't romantically involved with Roxanne, and he really wasn't linked to her in any way, negatively or positively. So the police then turned their attention to Vernon. Again, they found out that he had some history. Um, He had a police record with some petty crime, and he had been known to be very jealous. As law enforcement turned their attention to Vernon, he disappeared. So they made it a point to find him it started to look really suspicious, like maybe Vernon was responsible for this. The police investigated and learned that Vernon was actually in jail in Colorado. They went to Colorado to interview him. He confirmed that Roxanne was supposed to meet him in Taos and take him back to Colorado, but she stood him up. She never showed up. When the police told him that she had passed away, he became extremely emotional and burst into tears. Vernon said that he didn't believe that Johnny had anything to do with it. Vernon was asked about Ivan, and he confirmed that Ivan was strange, and he also stated that he was known to have a gun. Here's the thing about the bullet hole in Roxanne's skull. When it was looked into, it turned out that the the diameter of the bullet was not a common size for guns in the U.S. So that made it a little bit easier for the police to narrow it down when they were looking at potential murder weapons. So police decided to follow up with Ivan to see if they could learn more from him and hopefully get closer to uncovering what happened to Roxanne. In this interview, he started claiming that he was being set up and being framed. He claimed adamantly that he did not have a gun, even though many residents of Two Peaks verified and confirmed that he did have a gun. So before the interview wrapped up, Ivan started to bring something up. He claimed that he and Johnny went looking for firewood in July near Two Peaks. He started talking about a burned bra, and he claimed that he found that while looking for firewood. However, the information about the burned bra was never released to the public. The only people who knew about the bra were the Haggertys, law enforcement, and the killer. He also stated that he found a bone in that area. This caught the attention of the investigator, but because everything was so circumstantial, he really couldn't keep him there. But it did seem like Ivan was trying to explain away why his DNA may be found on Roxanne's remains and belongings. Ivan immediately became the top suspect. While all this is happening, somebody comes forward from the Taos community to say that they purchased a gun from Ivan. The police asked that person to turn the gun over, and they did. As the forensics team was looking at the ballistics and comparing the barrel size to the gunshot wound in Roxanne's skull, they found that it was a match. Now, we all know that this can't 100% be proven, but the fact that the diameter of the bullet was not something that's common in this country 
made it pretty clear that there's a good chance this is the murder weapon. So police call Ivan back for more questions. He agreed to meet the police the next day, but he never showed. He took off and he went on the lam. So police asked the public to be on the lookout for Ivan. And somebody called in with an anonymous tip to claim that Ivan was at the St. Elizabeth Men's Shelter in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Apparently, he was registered under an alias, and he had changed his appearance. So when the police got there, they found out he was registered under the alias Joseph Richmond. He grew a full beard and shaved his head so that he would not appear like the wanted posters that were placed all over the state. Investigators were able to identify him by the tattoos on his arm. Let's talk about Ivan. So Ivan is originally from West Virginia. He was known to be a domestic abuser. There's a rumor that his wife left him and went into hiding because of his abuse. Many people also said that he was known for really hating women. So nine months after Roxanne disappeared, on February 23rd, 2015, Ivan was arrested for murder. He was charged with first degree murder and tampering with evidence. This was due to the fact this was due to the fact that Ivan had sold his gun and tried to cover up his crimes. While in jail and awaiting trial, Ivan began sketching. The detective on this case became interested in the sketches and soon learned that every sketch had the word witch hunter written on the title. You see, Ivan was convinced that Roxanne was an evil witch. He thought for sure that she had cursed him and put spells on him. One of the key witnesses in the trial was his cellmate, who shared that Ivan said, the only way to stop a witch from cursing you is to kill them. A lot of people in the Two Peaks area also shared that Ivan claimed to be afraid of Roxanne. So, in 2016, the trial starts in Taos, New Mexico. The trial goes, I believe, for about two months. And the jury goes out for four and a half hours. And they come back with a conviction, guilty on both counts. He was sentenced to life in prison. So recently, in the last couple of years, Ivan Kales appealed the conviction to the state Supreme Court in New Mexico. However, the conviction was upheld. And he is going to serve out the rest of his life in prison. I know it doesn't bring Roxanne back, and this is a horrible story about the demise of a young woman's life, but there is some solace in the fact that Ivan is not going to be free ever again to hurt anybody else. And that is the true story of the murder of Roxanne Houston, Ivan Dennings Kales, the witch hunter. Thanks for listening to True Consequences. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to check us out on social media and tell your friends about us. A share would go a long way. We are listener supported. So if you feel so inclined, check out our Patreon page. Go to patreon.com slash true consequences. Without you, we have no show. So I appreciate all of our patrons. In fact, I'd like to send a shout out to a couple of new patrons today. Lisa M donated at the $20 a month green chili level. Thank you, Lisa, for your donation. And Monique S gave a one-time donation through PayPal of $20. Thank you, Monique. I appreciate you. Check back with us next Monday when we'll have a new episode of True Consequences. Thank you. And stay safe, New Mexico. And now I present to you the promo for True Crime by the Book, a true crime podcast. Enjoy. I'm a true crime enthusiast. Documentaries, podcasts, movies and books I love to read. If you have an appetite for the twisted, have I got a show for you. True Crime by the Book is a podcast hosted by me, Tasha Pierce, and it's from a bookworm's point of view. I read the book so you won't have to. Unless you want to, then by all means read. But whatever you do, join me every other Tuesday to talk real crime one page at a time. That's True Crime by the Book, wherever podcasts are served.
Thank you for listening to True Consequences. For more information about what you heard today, go to trueconsequences.com. If you like our show, please rate, subscribe, and review. We appreciate you taking the time to listen. You can also find us on Instagram at True Consequences Pod, as well as Twitter and Facebook. True Consequences is written, produced, edited, and created by me, Eric Carter Landine, your host. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>